Both Czechoslovakia and Hungary were liberated, or conquered, depending on your viewpoint, from Nazi occupation by the advancing troops of the Soviet Red Army. The Western Allies, dominated by the United States and Great Britain, recognized that, as a result of this, both of these countries fell into the Soviet sphere of influence, but still called for a democratic process and free elections to be held. I'm your host, David, and today we're going to examine how Czechoslovakia and Hungary became Soviet client states in the wake of the Second World War. But how did that happen? This is the Cold War. Stalin, always a pragmatist, was in favor of a gradual process of communization in these two countries, since the rebuilding of the Soviet Union itself was deemed a greater priority. He was also considering the presence of large numbers of American combat troops who still remained in Europe. He did not want to risk another war and instead chose a slower, more gradual path to dominate these two Central European nations. Overall, the path these two countries were set on were quite similar, but with, as you should expect, some differences along the way. We're going to start with Czechoslovakia a country that had only been a country since its creation by the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. During the war, it had been carved apart and even a new state of just Slovakia had been established with a puppet government loyal to Berlin. After the expulsion of the Nazis through 1944 and 1945 by the advancing Red Army, Czechoslovakia was reconstituted and, like in Poland, initially multiple political parties were allowed to function in the immediate post-war period. Only the Slovak Popular Party and the Republican Party of Farmers and Peasants were banned, the first as a result of collaboration with the Nazis, and the second as it was deemed too conservative. Czechoslovakia had established a government in exile based in London during the war, led by Edvard Benes. He assumed leadership in the immediate post-war government of Czechoslovakia, but was keenly aware of the Red Army occupation of his country put the Communist Party in a more favorable political position. Benes was eager to avoid yet another foreign occupation of Czechoslovakia and was prepared to make the concessions necessary. However, it's important to keep in mind that he envisioned his country as a bridge between the liberal, capitalist West and the Communist Soviet Union. As such, Benes's hope to be able to make a deal with the Communist Party and by promoting a neutral foreign policy hoped to avoid direct control from the Soviet Union. By 1945, he had accomplished this and Benes became the de facto president of Czechoslovakia, at the head of a leftist-dominated coalition government. His prime minister was the chairman of the Communist Party, Klement Gottwald, while other key ministries, such as Ministry of the Interior, which we should note controls the police force, defense, information, agriculture, and education, were also all held by Communist Party members. Of the key government portfolios, only the foreign ministry was held by a non-leftist, the diplomat Jan Masaryk. The government was largely pro-Soviet in nature, but had not proclaimed a Stalinist system with its command economy. In elections held in 1946, Benes was elected president. The Communist Party won 38% of the vote, while the conservative National Social Party took 18% of the vote. This 38% turned out to be the best result by a communist party from a free election in Europe's history. So really, we should look at why that is. What made the Czechoslovak communists just so popular in 1946? So it turns out that the votes for the communist party were very much cast as votes against the conservative right, who were still associated with the West and the perceived treason that the country had experienced in Munich in 1938. The Soviet Union held a fairly favorable reputation in the minds of many Czechoslovaks as the liberators of their country after the horrors of the Nazi occupation. Membership in the Communist Party rose from 27,000 in May of 1945 to over 1 million by the same time in 1946. Of course, we should add that the Czechoslovak Communist Party was vocal in proclaiming itself to be both pro-democracy and pro-nationalist. In 1947, Czechoslovakia was invited by the UK and France to participate in meetings regarding the Marshall Plan, the US-backed plan to fund the reconstruction of Europe. At first, both Benes and Gottwald 
who you have to remember is the chairman of the Communist Party, or in favor of accepting aid from the Marshall Plan, as they both knew it would help their country immensely. But I'm sure you can guess what happened next. Gottwald was summoned to Moscow, where he was reprimanded and forced to make a U-turn on his decision. Can you imagine what that meeting would have been like? In the wake of this meeting, the Communist Party changed tactics and began to accelerate their plans for the Sovietization of the nation. Propaganda campaigns were begun, claiming that a reactionary coup was being planned by the right. Demonstrations by workers, communist sympathizers, and trade unions were regularly held to apply pressure on non-communists. Despite the outward appearance of support these protests would have given, opinion polls showed that communist support was actually dropping, mostly due to the rejection of the Marshall Plan. The growing conflict between communist and non-communist forces came to a head in early 1948, after the interior minister, Václav Nosek, ousted the remaining non-communist police officers, remained on the force. Defying a government vote which would have reinstated the officers, Nosek stood his ground, and 12 non-communist government ministers offered their resignations to Benish, in protest. They did this hoping, or possibly assuming, their offer would be refused in order to put pressure on Nosek and Gottwald and subsequently form a new government. Benish did support the non-communists, but was also fearful of the real possibility of a direct Soviet invasion. Mass public protests erupted, many of them in support of the communists, and the police and armed militia took effective control of Prague to restore order. Anti-government protests were broken up, and Gottwald now demanded the creation of a new government, to be fully dominated by his communists, of course. The army, controlled by the communist defense minister Ludwig Svoboda, refused to interfere. The pressure that the communists were putting on Benesch proved to be too much for him, and a new communist-dominated government was formed in 1948. While other, smaller parties were part of the new coalition, they themselves had been taken over by communist sympathizers. Masaryk, the foreign minister, continued on as the only non-communist in the government, but was found dead mysteriously a few weeks later. It was declared a suicide at the time, but later investigations, after the end of the Cold War, deemed that Masaryk had been murdered. Gottwald's new government was issued a unanimous vote of confidence from the parliament after the resignation of the remaining opposition MPs, and waves of persecutions and arrests, as well as forced exile, came as a result of this communist takeover. A new constitution was proclaimed, declaring the country a people's democracy and establishing a dictatorship of the proletariat. This was followed in May of 1948 with an election where voters were presented with an electoral ballot that only listed the National Front. You can guess who won. Benesch resigned soon after this, and Gottwald became the new president of Czechoslovakia. Benesch himself passed away later in 1948, having failed to keep Czechoslovakia free of Soviet domination. So that was the story in Czechoslovakia. But what was happening further to the south of there, in Hungary? We should take a look at that now. Hungary had been an ally of Nazi Germany during the Second World War and had even participated in the German invasion of the Soviet Union. The Red Army, when it invaded Hungary in 1944, was not just fighting the Germans, but also the Hungarians. This was not an army of liberation, but one of occupation. Hungary was not declared pacified until April of 1945, when the last German troops were expelled from the country and the Red Army controlled the territory. With no governments in exile to contend with, the process of Sovietization went smoother than it had in Czechoslovakia, but was still done by means of elections and the domination of the political process by the communists. The Hungarian communists were split into two factions, one led by Matyas Rákosi and the other by László Rojk. You know what? A quick note about Hungarian names. In Hungary, surnames are usually said first and then the given name. However, I'm not Hungarian, so I'm choosing to read the names as somebody from Canada. First name first, last name last. I just wanted to acknowledge that quick little cultural fact in case anyone watching is either Hungarian and wants to call me out on it. 
or if you go looking for more research on this and are confused by the order the names are given. So where were we? Right, Matthias Rakosi and Lázaro Roy, the leaders of the two prominent communist factions. Rakosi had been leader of the Hungarian communists who had lived in exile in the Soviet Union in the war years and had been a chief organizer there. Rakosi enjoyed a good working relationship with the Soviets, which ended up being one of his most crucial advantages over Reich, who had led the pro-communist resistance to the Germans from inside of Hungary. Reich was in favor of the rapid establishment of a dictatorship of the proletariat. However, the more gradual Sovietization favored by Rakosi was the one taken. This was likely guided in part by the failed Hungarian Soviet Republic, led by Béla Kun in 1919, that had briefly and bloodily controlled Hungary, and was still in living memory for many. In November of 1945, three elections were held. These elections were a devastating defeat for the communists, and the Independent Smallholders Party, a center-right peasant party, won a staggering 57% of the vote, while the communists only managed 17%. This was counteracted, however, by Soviet Marshal Kliment Voroshilov, the head of the Allied Control Commission in Hungary. I'm sure you remember from our episode on Potsdam that the ACC was the body that oversaw the occupation forces after World War II. Voroshilov, despite their majority victory, would not allow them to form a government and force them into a coalition. While their leader, Zoltan Tildi, assumed the presidency, Rakosi became the deputy prime minister. Vitally, the smallholders party was forced to give the interior ministry and ministry of defense to the communists. Just like in Czechoslovakia, this allowed the Hungarian communists to infiltrate and dominate the army and the police, giving them the upper hand in the country. Roig assumed the office of the interior ministry and used his position to turn the police force into a communist organization. From there, he persecuted his political opponents, especially the representatives of the smallholders party. Under pressure from communist security forces, the prime minister, Ferenc Nodj, was forced in exile while other non-communists were arrested on charges of conspiracy against the republic. Religious organizations were banned at the same time as industry was nationalized. Although they were not popular enough to win an election, they held enough key government spots to allow them to project the power they held. In elections in 1947, the communists only took 24% of the vote, compared to the approximate 35% that was received by rightist parties. This failure at the polls forced the communists to use more direct methods, to achieve a full takeover of government. The Communist Party was forcibly merged with the Social Democratic Party, which had received 15% of the vote. All of the non-communists were then expelled from the newly merged party. President Zoltan Tildi was forced to resign and was replaced by somebody more sympathetic to the communists. In 1949, all opposition parties were declared illegal and the remaining parties were merged into the People's Front, which was led by the Communists. By August of that same year, a new constitution was adopted, and Hungary was proclaimed the country of workers and peasants. By 1950, in a series of ongoing purges, over 2,000 people had been executed, including Roig, who was sentenced on charges of treason and plotting against Rakosi. By this time, Rakosi had become quite keen on establishing Stalinist-style control over the country, with a nationalized command economy. Like in the Soviet Union, emphasis was on heavy industry, on the grounds that Hungary needed to be prepared for war with the West. The Sovietization of both Czechoslovakia and Hungary served as a clarion call to those in the West that the Soviet Union was a power willing and able to project beyond its own borders. The Treaty of Brussels and the creation of NATO were born from the West's need to organize to offset what they saw as a growing threat to their own security. It also gave way to the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany, as well as the defeat of communist movements in both Italy and France. Anti-communist hysteria in the United States, typified by McCarthyism, vilified and made an enemy of anybody suspected of being on the left of the political spectrum. Throughout the Western world, defense spending increased significantly as both sides prepared themselves for the long confrontation that was the Cold War. 
We will discuss it all in our future videos, so make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar. This is the Cold War channel, and we will catch you on the next one.